Okay, this Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Tuesday, September the 18th in the year 2012 here at the Niles Public Library in the large meeting room A. My name is Neil O'Shea and I am privileged to be speaking with uh, Dr. Erwin Williger. Uh, Dr. Williger was born on April 9th, 1913. Uh, Mr. Williger was born in Chicago, Chicago and still lives in Chicago. Still. And he learned of the Veterans History Project through another veteran of World War II whom we interviewed, uh, Dr. Jerry Levin. And uh, Dr. Williger has kindly consented uh, to be interviewed for this project. And here is his story. So, Dr. Williger, we have a series of, series of questions which the Library of Congress suggests that we can use as a starting point. Okay. But we don't have to follow them, you know, we, but we can start with them and we'll just see how it goes. Whatever you say. So, um, uh, Dr. Williger, do you, you re entered the service in 1940? 1939, 19, actually. 19, how did that come about? Well, I was, I was in training and, uh, uh, and uh, during our medical school days, somebody came and gave us a lecture about trying to sign the doctors, so-called doctors, to uh, uh, enlist as, and we would go in as first lieutenants if there was a war. Whoever thought about a war at the time, because I went to school from 34 to 38. Uh, and when I finished my training, I figured I'd put in my year and then get out and then go into practice. Well, I never got out because the war started and they said nobody gets out. So I wound up with four and a half years instead of a, a year. Dr. Wilger, if I could ask, what high school did you attend in Chicago? Roosevelt High School. Roosevelt High School. So that was, you were a rough rider then. A rough rider. Yeah. Yeah. And then you were attending medical school at, at Illinois. At Illinois. Yeah. So your one year uh, commitment turned out to be a little longer. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, it did. And um, do you, you, so you were living on the northwest side when, and then you attended medical school. Was that it? Was that it? Would have been, would that have been here in Chicago? No, I went. I, went down I, I uh, had my training in the county hospital in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, and the reason I went there is because my folks moved there. My dad was a clothing designer and uh, Palm Beach Company opened a factory in Knoxville and they transferred him. And uh, I was originally going to Portland, Oregon with a friend of mine we were accepted and there. So my father said, well, why don't you come here? We got a nice county hospital. I said, but that doesn't mean I can just say I can go. He says, I know the mayor. I'll get you in. <laughs> of course he did. He, he got me in and that's where I stayed while they lived there. And then from there, I... Uh, my senior resident and I were very close, and he was uh, hired by Peabody Coal Company to run their hospital in Highland, Kentucky, and he asked me to go with him as his assistant, and so that's where I went, and we ran that hospital, and from and uh, from, from there. Uh, that's when we finished there. That's when I went in the army. I mean, in the air force. So that that rec that recruiter or that gentleman, the person that came around and told you you could sign up for a year and go in as a first lieutenant, he was from, he was from the United States. Uh, he was from the uh, yeah the, the US army air, army air yeah airport, he was yeah. Uh, you know he was soliciting you know yeah. <laughs> you know we were what. What did we know about it? Everybody said, okay, we'll sign up. So 
when you come into the service as a doctor, do you still have to oh, go yeah. through? Do you still have to go through uh, basic training or anything like no. that? No. 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 no I, I was stationed at the station hospital in Wright Patterson Field right away uh, in the Air Force. And, uh, and that's in that's fairly famous airfield in well, that was Ohio, the headquarters. Right? Yeah. That, uh, right field was the research headquarters for the for the Air Force. So. And did the type of medical work you did there was it different from the work you had been doing in? Well, I I was doing general surgery. I was. Uh, uh, Chief of Surgery for the hospital, and uh, then they sent me to several places on temporary duty. They sent me to the flight training, uh, the the uh, flight surgeon training in uh, San Antonio, and then I, when I got through with that, I went back to my original place in Patterson Field. And then later on, they sent me to Walter Reed for a course in tropical medicine. And that's when I was getting suspicious of why are they sending me to all these different places. And and I every time I got through, I went back to Patterson Field. And then the last place they sent me was in Panama for a course in malariology. And, and then I was getting, you know, thinking, where are all the doctors in the service, why are they picking on me? And I just couldn't figure that out. Was this before war broke out, or was it... Uh... This was... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this was after war broke out. Oh, after the war broke out. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then when I came back from Panama, I went back to Patterson Field again, and shortly after that, a couple of fellows from the FBI visited me in my office at the hospital, and they wanted to know what my allegiance was to the United States. And of course, they had a dossier on me because they knew my folks were born in Hungary, and and, and so they, when they asked me what my, my allegiance was, I said, I mean, I think that's a very unusual question because I was born in here, I'm a natural citizen, I volunteered for the service, and of course they accepted that and. Uh, when they got through with, you know, questioning me, they were very nice, you know, they weren't trying to catch me on anything. And then shortly after that is when I got these secret orders and I just couldn't understand <laughs> why I got the orders. And now the orders read, you know, it was a crazy kind of an order. It was from the War Department, and it said, you know, uh, I was a captain at that time, that Captain Irwin F. Walker, serial number so-and-so, will proceed to New York or Miami, then fly the North Atlantic route to Gura, Eritrea. Well, I had no idea where Gura, Eritrea was. Uh, so when I went home, my wife and I got a map out and we looked and looked. It took us, took us two days to find out where Gurrier Tree was. Now, I, the orders read that I wasn't to delay in any one place for more than 30 days and that I was to be on per diem and, uh, you know, for my meals and so forth but they didn't tell me how to get there. So I had a, you know, that's all in this, in that's, that's all in this, in this letter that you're going to have. But eventually it took me about eight weeks to get to where I was going. And I went over on a banana boat to start with. 
Do you know where you sailed from on the banana boat? Yeah, uh, North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. And then you headed toward... Well, we stopped at Trinidad uh, to uh, refuel and stuff like that. And they had an Air Force base there, so I went over there and see if I could get a ride rather than go on a ship. Because when we got out of the 12-mile limit, the captain called us all together and said that we are carrying nothing but ammunition. It was a banana boat that was constricted by the army, by the air, uh, uh, War Department. Yeah. In those days, they were called the Merchant Marine. Liberty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All they had was the crew, the Merchant Marine to man the guns. No coverage. And and me. <laughs> yeah, I was the only one. And so I, when we stopped at the uh, Trinidad, I couldn't get a ride because they said they're not going that way. So I got back on a ship, and uh, the next stop was going to be Cape Town. South Africa. So you're South going to Africa. South yeah. yeah, okay. So, I, you know, while I was on a ship, I got acquainted with the first mate and the, the uh, navigator and all those fellows that, you know, knew that I was alone. And I, I was talking to the, uh, to the navigator one day, and he tells me that they're going through the Straits of Madagascar, and the Japs are sinking all the ships that are going through there. <laughs> oh, I said, well, my order said not to delay more than 30 days in any place. So I told the captain, I said, I'm getting off at Cape Town, and I hope that someday you'll write me a letter and let me know. I, they were going to uh, uh, Karachi, India. Oh, yeah. So I, I did get off at Cape Town, and uh, I finally uh, got the South African Air Force, which is in there, to drive me, to fly me to uh, Guru Eritrea. That's how I got there. Dr. Williger is um, re referring to a, um, a statement that he's worked on with uh, uh, his friend Marjorie Waldner, and we're going to make that part of the interview. And uh, there's a few more details provided in that uh, memoir, which will be included in this interview. Uh, that's amazing. They give you secret orders, and you got to you have to be your own travel agent. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 It, it was a harrowing trip. <laughs> Believe me. Very, very involved. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever get seasick or anything like that? Oh, no. 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 Never bothered me. Yeah, you, must be a, you must be a good traveler. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So the South Africans flew you up to uh, Eritrea then. Yeah. And then when did you learn what the point of the secret orders were? Or what? I was very friendly with one of the pilots at Patterson Field. I mean, he, see, I was on flying pay, and by being on flying pay as a flight surgeon, you had to put in so many hours a month in order to collect that flying pay, which was half of your base pay, which is a, was a lot of money to me in, in those days. And, of course, I was very friendly with most of the guys, but this guy in particular, was I had operated on his kids and his wife, at the station hospital. And he came to me one day and said, I'm leaving uh, on such and such a day. I said, well, where are you going? He says, I'll get in touch with you when I get there. Well, he never got in touch, in touch with me after a couple of months. And I wondered, yeah, I thought about him. Well, he had asked for me to become his personal flight surgeon wow. and work with him at on this uh, Douglas Aircraft at a factory in Gore, Eritrea that was that was servicing the British Spitfires 
on the desert, uh, we're flying the Desert Warrior, the Ramel. Ramel, yeah. Yeah. So he wanted me to be his, uh, you know, his associate and uh, and be a liaison between Douglas and the Air Force. When they have the the job title flight surgeon, that means that you perform surgery on Air Force on pilots and that crew. It doesn't mean you perform surgery in the air. It means you're oh, a flight no, surgeon. No, yeah, no. yeah. No, you yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what they call them, flight surgeon. Yeah. If you were a graduate from the School of Aviation Medicine. So that's he. He's the one that requested. <laughs> Do you recall his name or? Uh, he, no, I, I should. I should know his name. He had quite an effect on your life. <laughs> oh yes, he is. He did have a lot of effect. He could have told me that right, you know, right away, and I wouldn't have worried about it. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so you were you were stationed in in Eritrea for a, a period of months, or not very long? Not very long, because uh, as I told you, that Douglas had this plant, and they were getting their supplies that came through the Straits of Madagascar, and they weren't getting their supplies because the ships were being sunk. And they had they had a hospital there, and they had twelve civilian doctors. Talk louder, Frank. Uh, working in the hospital, and I was supposed to, you know, supervise that. That was supposed to be my job. But there was, you know, there was nothing doing. Uh, there was nothing uh, going were, on. Were the other doctors Americans? The other doctors were American. Mm -hmm. They were civilians making a big buck. <laughs> and, uh, well, after a while, you know, I, I wasn't doing a lot. So I talked to this friend of mine, you know, that called me. I said, you know, I appreciate your thoughtfulness of, you know, asking for me and going through all this trouble. But, you know, as long as I got to be away from my family, I want to be where the action is. I don't want to be just sitting around and collecting my pay. So he transferred me to Cairo, Egypt. And uh, at that time, that bomb group had landed in Palestine for refueling, and uh, that's, that was the Halverson group. And uh, by that time, I was a major, so I was a senior officer. So they, they, the fellow, the general in in Cairo, Egypt, transferred me to that uh, group. And since I was a senior officer, I, I was in charge of the medical. There was four other doctors, so I was in charge of the medical part of it. And uh, as I said, that was a select group that was scheduled for this task force. And they were all handpicked by this Colonel Halverson. And uh, they had three professors, civilian professors, along with them, because one of them could speak Chinese, and one knew where all the airports was, and one knew where all the uh, gas dumps were. And what they were going to do was fly to China and then bomb uh, Japan and then come back to a different airport each time uh, so they wouldn't know where they were coming from. Well, while we were there getting this thing serviced, R Rommel had indicated that he was going to counterattack and take over Cairo. So somehow or other Churchill found out that we were there and he called Roosevelt and he asked him, can we borrow that put, uh, group for a mission to bomb the Ploesti oil fields? 
in order to stop Rommel from drive getting, to getting, getting Cairo gas. and the Suez Canal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we, we got orders to stay where we were and fly this mission to the Ploesti oil field. Well, they did a pretty good job because we got a citation from the president. Uh, and uh, four of our planes ran out of gas, so they were interned in Turkey because Turkey was, they had a land in Turkey, and Turkey was neutral. So those four planes stayed there. So, of course, we, had, we got stuck. And uh, uh, Montgomery, who was the general of the British 8th Army, got us to stay where we were and be the air support for his... He was going to counterattack. Yeah, he stopped Rommel at uh, yeah. Tobruk. Yeah, he was going to yeah. see. He stopped him at El Alamein. Yeah. yeah. And then, so we moved from Palestine to uh, Egypt to the Heliopolis Airport, and then we followed the British Eighth Army. Uh, and all we did was bomb uh, tankers coming across the Mediterranean gasoline tankers, and and all the ships in Tobruk and Benghazi, and and we, <laughs> we got as far as Tripoli, and then Eisenhower came in from the uh, from the other side, side, yeah, and then they got him bottled up and he surrendered. Yeah. So when he surrendered, uh, then we got our planes back. That four those four planes back. And one of the fellows, one of the pilots, was a, a little goofy from what the experience he had of being intern and so forth. So I, uh, my commanding officer, said, "Why don't you? The war is over here. Why don't you go back to the states and take him with you for rest and recreation?" And so I, I went back to the states after the uh, war in Africa. And uh, were those planes, were those B-17s? 17s and 24s. 17s and 24s. Yeah. yeah, mostly 24s. And I suppose some of the times the pilots didn't come back or... Oh, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, was a, that was a sad part of my job. You've seen these guys off. Yeah. And then having to have supper and they're not there. Yeah. Yeah. The cream of youth. And yeah. Oh, yeah. They were the cream of That's right. They, as I say, they were all hand-picked. Yeah. All college graduates. Yeah. And so I I, I was stationed in, in the, when I came back, I, I was stationed in Miami Beach. Uh, the, I was in charge of six hospitals on a beach for rest and recreation of uh, flying personnel. So when you're in charge of six hospitals, you're doing a lot of administration and management. No. no Not really? No. No. I, no. Uh, still you're still No, you're, I had some other You're still doing surgery in six yeah, hospitals. Doing, you're still, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, matter of fact, one of the hospitals had a fellow that I knew from County Hospital. And we were working together doing the surgery. Uh, and then eventually, I got transferred to a, uh, a an evac hospital that was going to Europe. And I went to o Oklahoma. I don't forgot the name of the city where I joined this evac hospital. It was like a mass unit. And uh, we followed Patton in Germany. So, you, so after you come back to the States and to Miami, then you're back in Europe? Yeah. Or you're in Europe. And you make that journey by plane or by ship? No, we went by ship. But this time, I went with a group. We went with a, a, a big ship. A big ship. Yeah. 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 Big ship. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then, of course, when the war ended there, then I eventually got back home. Yeah. 
So your one year turned into four and a half or something. It was five and a half, five and actually. And a half. Yeah. Because I had so much time off coming. Yeah. Because you know, I never took off it. You know, I was all alone, so I had no place to go. Yeah. The um, when you when you heard the presentation from the army officer about being able to join uh, as a first lieutenant uh, in the army, did did your did you did you did your did your parents uh, share in that decision? What did did they have anything to say about no. it? They didn't mind. No. 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 No, I just told them that we signed up. Uh, oh. yeah. No, no, because this was in uh, '39. So it wasn't quite so. Oh, no, 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 no. He came to when we were, I think, June, uh, sophomores. Oh, okay. See? So that's that a good was, idea then. Yeah. So that was uh, in uh, probably '36. Oh, well, he just got us all in the, in the auditorium, you know, and made this big speech about what a great life it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I had another vet like that. He was in, a, like, first year engineering or someplace, and they made a spiel to him, and then the next thing he knows is he wound up at the Battle of the Bulge, you know. Yeah. I mean, Hell yeah. Because yeah. yeah, yeah. they, change, they change the program as the yeah. war gets yeah. worse. Yeah. 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 This, this is this okay. This is this another article. You're in tanks. This is another article. I, I volunteered at Mayo Clinic, so they wrote that up. That's the Mayo's. Yeah. All right, now so let me show you this book. Okay. But this is, a, this is an article that was in Health Magazine. Yeah, I think that I was agree. picked up from a newspaper article. Yeah, you know, once you get it in the newspapers, they take it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll make a copy of that. Let me copy of this. Oh, oh, brilliant! Oh, high marks. So I'm, I will scan this, and we can, this can will be on the. You I, can have that. Take I got, the, the, I got the original. So, Dr. Wilger is just. Uh, presented us with a handsome photograph of a handsome soldier. Uh, so do you know when this picture was taken? That must have been taken when I came home. Uh-huh. And then the lucky, the four-leaf clover on the, well, the red major. background. That's the sixth. That's major insignia. Major insignia. Yeah. Did you... Um, as an officer, was it easier? Was it easy, or did it make any difference for you to stay in touch with your family while you were overseas? Oh, no problem. No problem. No, we had those. Yeah, you know, it's gonna go on the camera. Keep it just. Yeah. We we had, uh, you know, the APL number, and we had that special paper uh, that you wrote on that was very light. And no. You didn't have to worry about V-mail or things like yeah, that. It was, yeah, oh, it was a V-mail. It was a V-mail. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, no. No, I, I had no trouble getting my mail. Uh, I think only once was it censored. Uh, but other than that, I got all the letters from my family and uh, my wife. And, no, I had no trouble. And then during that that period of service, you mentioned that you were able to get back home once. Did, did you get any other rest and recreation periods, or your? Well, when I was in Miami, in Miami, my fam, my wife, and my youngest son came down. I rented a home, and we we were there for about eight months, I imagine. Before you went to Europe. Before I went to Europe. So then in Europe, you were working in, in hospitals in France and then in Germany? No, we had, a, you know, tent stuff. Tents. Yeah, in the VAC hospital. Yeah. Like the mass units. Yeah. But you moved around. You didn't stay on one yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. Was there um, any time that you felt your unit was in, was in imminent danger or you felt you should, the, the hospital had to be moved or anything like no, that? Or, no, no. I don't think we were ever in real danger with Patton in front of us. <laughs> what did you think of Patton as a oh, general? Oh, uh, great. If, if he, was, he and MacArthur were alive today, we would never have lasted that long 
in Iraq and in uh, Afghanistan. That war would have been over in a week or ten days. Those guys were, you know, they didn't have a good reputation, but they were good generals. You didn't think that uh, General Patton was too hard on his men or anything like that? Well, I, I didn't have anything to do with him, except that, you know, we were following where he... Uh, and he moved pretty quickly, I think. But he, he, he believed if, if you're fighting a war, destroy everything, and he did. He destroyed places that when we got there, there wasn't a person a dog or an animal or a cat any place around. Nobody. Absolutely. I ha I had movies of that. I don't know what happened to the movies. But anyway, here's uh, this is a, a book that my nephew made for me. It's got the story that she wrote and then it's got a lot of war pictures in here. Yeah, from um, Africa, if you want to If I can uh, look at it and see if there's anything of interest. Yeah. Do, are the originals of these pictures? Do these they are originals. These are the originals. These yeah. are originals. Yeah. I would like, I wonder if I can, uh, without opening this up too much, it would be, it would be very useful, illustrative of the of the interview. If I could scan some of these, could and then we build them in at the back. Do what you want to do. If that's okay. Oh, this looks like somebody we know here. Yeah, that's a beauty. Is that? Oh, that's, that's the man. That's my office in the desert. That, so this uh, Dr. Major Williger is yeah. sitting at there with a pen in hand in the desert, and this is in Palestine or North Africa. That or was in North Africa. North Africa. Yeah. Wow. So you did, and then you, the uh, evacuation, this evacuation hospital unit, they did go into Germany then at the end. We were, yeah, we were in Germany. Well, well the war ended when we were in Germany. Yeah. Shortly after we got there. Yeah. That's not Wow. Good job. Um, I'm wondering what... So, did you, was it... You, when the war ended, you you were still a doctor. Oh yeah. So you, you didn't have to worry. If it wasn't. Or was it? Did, in, usually the veterans when they came back, it, they had to find their old job, or maybe they couldn't get their old job back, or take on no. a different line of work, or no, worry I, about where they could live. I, I, I had never been in practice, so when I got back, I had to start from scratch because I was broke. <laughs> uh, you know, I had three kids, and I had to get a place for to live. And, and you came back. To, you came to Chicago. I came back to Chicago. Was was your wife from Chicago? She, originally, she was from Boston, and then she moved to California. But most of her life was in Chicago. The um, so you set up you set up a practice here in in Chicago. Then. Yeah. 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 Did you um, did you stay in contact with your any of the people you met during the war? Yes. The war buddies yes, or things I, like that. There were two people I kept in constant until they died. The yeah. last one died a couple of years ago. Chris. Yeah. Yeah. So. He's an anesthesiologist, wasn't he? No, he was. Uh, you no, know, when he came back. Well, he stayed. When I got discharged, they offered me a full colonelship, but I. <laughs> you wouldn't stay. Right? I, I said no. I said away too long, and that was it. But these two fellows did stay, and they got to be colonels, and they went to camp every year, and uh, and I kept in touch with them until both of them passed away. You know, I don't have any friends. You know, when I was about eight or nine years old, I started a neighborhood boys club by myself. And I started with about ten boys from my class, you know, in grammar school. I was in grammar school. And uh, 
then we then we went to junior high, and then we and then somebody heard about the club and they wanted to get in, so we got some more members, and then we all went to Roseville, and we picked up more members there. We wound up with 50 members, 50 members, and most of us went overseas. And most, all of them came back okay. And we stayed together for about 50 years. Wow. And I'm the last one left. The founder and the president are still. <laughs> I founded the place, yeah. and I'm the last and you're the one last, left. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that when you were doing your volunteer work in, uh, in, in Scottsdale, it was for a, a boys club. Yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. So it's kind of a continuing, you know, matter of fact, continuing theme in your matter life. Matter of fact, I... I I donated my scooter to the boys' club. I, I was going to get a new one, and I, I donated the... Uh, that was your Honda 50cc? My Honda 50cc. Well, he using the I loved it. He was in Florida when he was running around. I loved that thing. That's when he started with the scooter. So the scooter was something you, you developed when you You know how I learned to ride a motorcycle? Am I taking too much time? Not enough. Oh, oh yeah, not enough. You know... The Italians wanted no part of that war in the desert. They surrendered by the thousands. And uh, they had a, uh, what they call a sand bike. You could ride a motorcycle in the sand, and they were very stable in the sand, you know. Uh, so we picked up a bunch of them, and when the planes would go out on their mission, we would ride these things around the desert, you know, and uh, and then we had, uh, they had these, uh, uh, what do you call these? Uh, Dirt bikes. No, uh, these ships without a motor. Uh, yeah. What do you call those? Oh. You know, they all have a glider. Gliders. They had gliders. <laughs> so we'd get about 12 of these listed men get a tire rope on it, and they'd pull it, and we'd go up about 20 feet. <laughs> so that's the way we spend our time when the ships are gone. <laughs> yeah. But that's where I learned to ride a motorcycle. Yeah. And then when I, when I had to make rounds in Miami at the six hospitals, I bought a bicycle that had a motor on it. It was a motor bike. A bicycle with a motor. Well, it wasn't a scooter. And that's the way I made my rounds, because my car was being used by my wife. Was it hot in North Africa? Oh, was it hot? You know, the thing that I don't understand, it could get to 120, 130 during the day, and at night, you never... We used to sleep in our flying clothes, you know, those fleece line pants and jackets and helmets, and we never could get warm because it would drop down to, say, maybe 85. And that variation was just, we had to have uh, little furnaces that we to stay warm. But during the day, it was hot, 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 really hot. It was just like Phoenix. Only you, all you had was right. sand, you know, and the sandstorms were terrible. Yeah. Those were terrible. Uh, Usually, when there's a standard question in the interviews, and that's, um, how do you think your military service and your experiences in the service affected your life? I thought it was a good experience. Yeah. yeah as long as I came back. Safe. Yeah. Uh, when I look back, I thought it was a good experience. I met a lot of nice people and associated with nice people. Yeah. And uh, you met a lot of different kinds of Americans uh, oh, in, in World yeah. War Two, I think. Yeah. 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 It's amazing that all people from all walks of life they all sort of blended into a cohesive yeah. unit and yeah. accomplished a great common goal. Yeah. 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 They often spoke about, you know, having a, a reunion 
And I've been in Chicago all my life, and you know, I'm sure they could have found my name. But uh, they never got in touch with me. Now, the, the roster is in that. Uh, yeah, the pinout here of the. And the fellow that took my place as, as the uh, senior flight surgeon, his name is in there. But not mine, because I left early. Oh. I took this fellow home, you know. So, oh, yeah. So I guess. This is from I guess they, I guess they never it's considered no me. Yeah. But his name is George Richardson, and uh, he was in, in the flight surgeon school with me. He was a student, so I got to know him very well. But he he stayed with the group, and when the war ended in Africa, I think that group went to. Uh, England is the uh, American 8th Eighth Air Force, and I think he went with them. This is 70, goes all the way up to 75, and he had already left. Yeah. So that's why he's not... Yeah. And then when you go back, when you go back to the war, back to Europe, you're no longer associated with the... The, no, 380, no. the 376 no, no. with the uh, no, Patton's no, uh, that was the 40th Army Medical Support. 40th evac, EVAC Hospital. 40th EVAC? No. 40th EVAC Hospital. Here's another kind of a standard question we asked Dr. Williger. Um, do you think, did your, has your military experience, has it influenced your thinking about war or the military in general? Oh, yeah. Tough life. You have to be crazy to go to war. Absolutely. I don't, you know, I can't understand why people want to kill each other when there's so many things to live for. Yeah, crazy. But it's been going on from time immemorial, and it's never going to stop. Uh, you know, they said World War II was a war to end all wars. World War I. World War I, but war... World War II was even worse, but right, it never stopped. There was Korea, and then uh, Vietnam, and then uh, a couple of skirmishes in between. Ba Baghdad, and, uh, you know, it just doesn't stop. That's part of a way of life, a way of life. War is a way of life especially in the European and third world countries. They're always having revolutions. Or yeah. It must be very d difficult to be a, um, um, a military surgeon you know, in all the wars. And oh. then lately, these, all these men with the, with the oh, amputated now. limbs and the things. Now, oh. now, the lives they save, we never could have done what they do now. No way. You see some of these fellows with uh, prosthesis that you never would think that they have a prosthesis. Yeah. Yeah. When you um, you mentioned it was sort of like a a mesh arrangement with the field hospitals and the tents in Europe. Was it ever anything like it? It wasn't the television show. I mean, were there? Was, what? was it anything like the television show? I mean, were there oh, no. crazy characters or no. funny things? Or no, 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 no. No, it was pretty. Oh, we used to have some fun, but you know. Were you in a building though? You weren't. They were. You weren't intense like they were. We were intense. Oh, and they were the same setup. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have movies of that, but I don't know where those two tapes are. I have movies of this. Uh, I have a movie of doing the the whole procedure of an appendectomy. <laughs> yeah. Doctor Willow, you're an amazing man. It's a it's, well, a, it's an honor to, I don't know uh, it's an honor to be talking I, to you. I I enjoyed I enjoyed my life. You know, they speak about the golden years. Well, I think they are golden years. Uh, most people don't because they don't feel good. But I, you know, I've been in good health, except for this last year. Uh, but I still am able to get around, you know. 
I'm not an invalid. Not at all. Yeah. You traveled quite a few miles to come to the library today. We appreciate that. Yeah. Is there, um, we're kind of reaching the end of the interview. Is there, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered or particularly? No. No, not unless there's something here that yeah. you want to. How was the Army food? Pretty good? Uh, well, uh, if you like spam, <laughs> we, have, we have a chef that could make spam 80 different ways, but it was still spam. You ate pretty good on the ship, though. Oh, uh, going on that, you know, this was the, uh, this ship belonged to the United Fruit Company. You know, it was a ship that went eight knots an hour. It, you know, no escort or anything. We just were out in the ocean by ourselves. But I sat with the captain. He was very good to me. And we used to have steaks and lobster <laughs> and flowers on the table. And, uh, and, and, a, and a cargo full of ammunition yeah. and no escort. Well, you couldn't have an escort with ammunition. Uh, but he was really nice to me. Uh, Any of you, you were blessed also with three children and six grandchildren? I have, uh, let me see, I have five grandchildren and two great grandchildren. Have, have they ever had, were, did any of them ever enter military service or? My, one of my grandsons uh, couldn't get a job and he joined the. Uh, he had a degree in finance, and uh, he's very religious. Uh, and he went. He went to. He went to the yeshiva. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know it in New York. Yeah. He got his degree in, in you know, plus the Jewish uh, degree, also in finance, and. Uh, he decided he wanted to live in Israel, and he went to Israel, and he uh, he got a good job for a telephone company that was based in New Jersey, and he had about 20 people working for him. He had a good job, was making a good buck, and uh, he married one of his employees. He married one of his employees, and uh, after about a year, they had a baby. And he called me one time, and he said, you're coming back to Chicago. I said, why? He says, this is no place to raise a kid. I said, well, there's a lot of kids there. Uh, didn't want to raise his, his uh, daughter there. So he came back here to Chicago, because his parents live in Chicago, and he couldn't get it. He got jobs, but they were menial jobs. And she, her folks lived in Florida, so they moved to Florida, and he got a few jobs there, but they were just, you know, commission jobs and not enough to make a living. So. He made up his mind that he was going to go in the service, and they gave him a good deal. They gave him a bonus of twenty medical corps twenty thousand dollars in the medical corps, and uh, he's going to be he's going to be and, be a, 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 a and uh, nurse assistant. And they gave him a lot of. Uh, they gave him a night. They didn't give him a, he wasn't a book private, he had a special rank because of his degree in finance. So, and he, and he loved it. And he's, he's doing more work than I did when I was a senior in medical school. I couldn't believe what he's doing. Yeah. And he's still in, he was in, he was in uh, Afghanistan for a year. Wow. Came back okay. And uh, when I went to the honor thing, he met us at the uh, war memorial. Oh, beautiful! Yeah, yeah it looked terrific. Yeah. So there's echoes of uh, echoes of your career and your grandsons. Yeah, 
yeah. present well, career. Yes. Yeah. He's still already stationed in Virginia. Well, Virginia. it's surprising, you know. They give you a bunch of letters. Um, they call it mail, you know, like he'd got mail from. And I'm surprised what my grandchildren, you know. I never thought they thought about me. Oh, of course. Well, what they wrote yeah. was unbelievable. Oh, the letters for the, the mail letters. call on the way the home. Mail call, yeah. The yeah. mail call. The mail call. Unbelievable. Yeah. I just couldn't believe that you were my grandchildren. Yeah. 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 It's wonderful that, that that honor flight is just a wonderful Oh, event. you know, you got to go there and be in it to, to uh, an to appreciate yeah, I, I what they do, what they do. Yeah, there's other other uh, cities. Other cities. What, but, they, um, what they do is unbelievable. Yeah. The library makes a contribution every year to the uh, to the honor thing? flight. Oh, they do. Yeah, and um, oh, I know they have. They get all. And the next this November, I think I might have sent you an invitation for that. We have a veterans history project breakfast here in November. Yeah, yeah, you did. We got it. So I hope you yeah, might. Yeah, we're going. Oh, good. Oh, we yeah. Could, yeah. You mean the breakfast? Yeah. 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 Because yeah. there'll be some honor flight, veterans of the honor flight will be there. Some who just, re, who just came back. Oh. And. Um, oh, everybody's glowing when they oh, come back. Oh, yeah. And then They're the, so impressed. And then the, the feeling at Midway is like, oh, my oh, God. My. I, I only went there once, and I felt afterwards when I came home like I'd been at a funeral and a wedding, and I just did the emotion. It's just it is they, oh, they must have had five hundred people there. Yeah, and and the uh, the sailors with that saluting. Yeah, and everybody shake want to shake your hand. And, yeah. Uh, you know, they, they acted like you were the president Sadly of the United States. <laughs> yeah, well, you were. Uh, I I couldn't get over it. You know, I knew about this for a long time, but a couple of fellows finally talked me into it, and uh, I said, "Okay, I'll go." And that was this this year, was it? Yes, a couple, yeah. weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we might. Have, I, I think some of the vets who are here, you may meet. You'll meet them, I think, on in, in November. A couple of them may have been. One of them may have been on that flight. I have a feeling. There was also a Mr. Uh, a Mr. Tim Chuck from Niles that went there. He was at uh, Normandy. But um, I don't know. But uh, yeah. now I think they're going to try and get the Korean vets to. That's get, what they said. Yeah. 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 Well, they're going to run out of <laughs> World War II veterans. Yeah, they're all getting promoted. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to add to the interview, Dr. Williger? If anything comes to mind afterwards, no. we can always we can always add a little bit. Well. I, I think uh, the best years of my life was when I retired and started to volunteer at three hospitals and the baseball. I, I just had a wall. It was the best years of my life. To, and two hospitals. And I met so many people, and and they they call me and say, "We wish you came back." And uh, yeah. So what 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 is a, an experience? Professional expert surgeon when they when they retire and they go back back to volunteer at a hospital. We don't do anything medical. Oh don't, no! But don't you do you miss that at all though? Or? No. 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 No, because I, I'm associated with such nice people that that they appreciate that you're there. Yeah. They they couldn't function without. Yeah. Volunteers. They couldn't function without volunteers. They could, but it would cost them a lot of money. None of them could. They saved millions of dollars. I re didn't realize the amount of money that the, they uh, saved. Yeah, but they tell us every year. Yeah, every year they say they save about three million dollars. Uh, but I really enjoyed those years. And that's when you were volunteering at Mayo. Mayo. Yeah, Scottsdale. Scottsdale Healthcare and Evanston. And Evanston. And the baseball, and then I baseball. when I when I when my kids moved out of my the house, uh, I uh, that's when I gave up my practice, and I went to work for Holy Family Hospital as the first surgical assistant, and I was there for 15 years. What year would that have been? Seventy something. Seventy something. Yeah. 
I, I really had a, I really enjoyed that because because I wasn't uh, tied down to any responsibility other than being there to help whoever needed help yeah. for surgery. And they were nice, and the sisters treated me uh, uh, very well, very well. I'm thinking of you riding the riding riding the scooter in uh, in Phoenix, and then riding the scooter in uh, oh, Miami, and then riding the scooter or the Italian scooters well, in the, in North Africa. Until it, it, he got macular degeneration about three years ago, he had to give up the scooter and drive yeah. it. Yeah. About, about four years. Well, I still have an electric three-wheeler scooter. I got two of them. Yeah, sidewalks. Stay on the sidewalk. Yeah, well, I, I, can, I can do some of my you own errands eight miles an hour. without, uh, you know, being dependent upon anything. Yeah. yeah. But we, we, we met at Evanston Hospital, and we've been together for 17 years. So our, we've been through all this. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think one of his biggest pleasures is telling his story. Well, it's one of the getting very proficient at it. Yeah, well, it's one of the most uh, meaningful parts of my my job is to participate in this uh, veterans history project because you meet so many wonderful people. No, I I, I think I had a good life. Yeah, but I can't complain. He's lucky. His health has been pretty good. Yeah. One thing. You know, during the dep Depression, my father always made a good living, and we never were bothered by the Depression, although I, I mean, I knew about the bread lines and the soup kitchens, and, you know, I was, you know, I was five years old. Yeah. But your your father relocated from uh, Chicago down to... Yeah. 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 It was a brief time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Williger, Marjorie, and uh, okay. maybe we'll conclude the interview at this point. Uh, uh -huh. But anything that we want to add, we can do that. I've had vets come back and say, you know, I've got to tell you this story. You're not going to believe this, you know. And then we, we put it on. It's great, you know. You're the you're the boss. Whatever you however you want this to turn out is is, is how it will turn out. And uh, but yeah. uh, anyway, I think maybe at the at this point I'll turn no, off the. Uh, the, the, the craziest part of my life was that trip. You know, sometimes I sit sit down and say, how, how did I get to where I was supposed to go? You read that. You'll yeah, we'll, we'll you know, fill that in. And I had to, you know, I had to, really good. I had to carry my, I, did it, I had to carry my bedroll, my sleeping bag. How did I carry all that Slept stuff? Around for you know, from one three, place months. to the other, you know. When I got off that ship in Cape Town, in a big city, I said, where do I go? <laughs> where do I go from here? <laughs> I think it's amazing they have this important position for you, and they yeah. give you a document that's secret orders. And when I got there, Big deal. I mean, right? I mean, yeah. you, you still have to implement it. Effect it. How do you, uh, you right. know, convey yourself from the States yeah. to around the, yeah. the Horn, of, uh, Horn of Africa? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a harrowing trip. But, you know, I, I made it somehow. Yeah, good, I don't know how. Your good I, fortune, your good I never can realize helped. how I could have possibly do what I did. You know, all by myself. What did I know? I didn't know all these places. They were new to me. Uh, fortunately, when I got to Cape Town, I ran into some nice lady. And she obviously she saw me carrying all this stuff. Well, that's in the story. Yeah. So I, she says, uh, "What are you gonna? Do? What are you doing here?" I said, "Well, I'm just going to report to where I'm supposed to go." She said, "Well, would you like to stay with us overnight and have dinner?" And they were very nice to me. <laughs> so did all these different people that you met were there? Did you have any favorite people or nationalities or groups or? They're all members of the human race, or but the South Africans. Most of the people nice. that I met are they're very nice, very nice. Except some of the Muslims, you had to be very cautious about them. You know, <laughs> you know, I used to collect uh, 
you know, I didn't smoke, but my wife smoked. So we used to, I used to get an allotment of cigarettes and, and uh, uh, candy and chewing gum. Well, that was like money. It was like gold. And I used to buy nylon hose in France and send them home, you know, uh, and silk gloves. And, uh, uh, so. Did you play a lot of poker games or anything like that? Or? We, no. Too much. We, we did play shoot craps once in a while. But we were being paid in pounds or something. <laughs> you know, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, yeah. so you know it was just paper and money, guys. Yeah. They had nothing to spend it on. Yeah. 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 We had nothing to spend. Nothing. Yeah. Although I, I had a cheap. Uh, it was assigned to me as a senior medical officer. So I did travel the Middle East. I went to. To Damascus and uh, Baghdad and uh, uh, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, and so I did get around. Used to go on foraging trips with your airplane. On what? Foraging trips, looking for food. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, as I say, when I was a flight chair, they, they taught me how to, you know, fly. I never landed or took off, but they would let me fly. But you hold the controls in the air? Com. Yeah, I used to fly as a co-pilot or he'd get the mail in, uh, in Cairo. So when I came back to Miami, there was a school there. Uh, and I went over there, and I told this guy uh, that, you know, I've been flying for a long time and a lot of hours, and I, I, I'd like to at least solo and get the thrill of it. <laughs> so they had the uh, Piper yep. Cub seaplanes. And, uh, and I told him my experience. So I took about eight hours of dual control, I mean dual control, plus, you know, the literature that I had to be examined on. And after eight hours, he says, you're ready to fly. <laughs> I said, are you sure? He says, I, I have confidence in you. And I did. I flew. And, uh, Biggest thrill of my life being up there and nobody bothering you and nobody around. It was the biggest thrill of my Free life. Free as a bird, yeah. 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 And I had no trouble landing. Uh, Any of these, um, all these various interesting, exotic, foreign locales, uh, after the war, did you ever feel like you wanted to go back and see how it was today or not necessarily? No. No. I, there's no place like the United States. No, no way. There's no place that I would... Well, you went to Palestine. You went to Israel a couple of times. That, that was a, a highlight of my... Uh, I happened to go to the Hadassah Hospital there, and Golda Meir was my dosa. Wow. Uh, and she showed me around the hospital and introduced me to a lot of the uh, German scientists that had come to Israel and was doing research in Israel. So I met a lot of uh, you know, top men that I had read about in books in you know, med school. Wow. Uh, so that was... Uh, that was that was after the war. Or no, no, was no. That was when he was stationed. That's when oh, I was so stationed. Oh, formative there. years. Yeah, formative but years. I did yeah. go back. I oh, I did oh, go I back did after the Six Day War. Yeah. And then I went back once more with Hadassah. Uh, okay. That's when we went to the Golan Heights. And then my 
my grandson got married there, and I went back then. So I've been there four times. But, you know, the difference between the first time, though, as I say, um, yeah. When I was there the first time, there was two hotels, you know, the Dan Hotel on the Mediterranean. And the YMCA. And, and the YMCA. Oh, and the King David. That's all. And and there were no, you know, fruit trees and all that kind of When I went back for my grandson's wedding, God, I couldn't believe it. There's no more land left. It's a zoo. No more land. It's an absolute No zoo. place they can go. Movement. Everything is all Beautiful high rises. They're always tearing down something, building yeah, something else. I remember my father visited there in the 60s and was very impressed. And he just said they made the desert bloom. I remember that was what oh, he said. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what they did there is unbelievable. Yeah. It's a constant state of flux. I can see why Rob wanted to come home because it's it's hectic. Yeah, yeah but I never felt unsafe well, there. But, yeah, but you didn't live like Rob and, and Yale did and the baby and so forth. It, it, it could be very unnerving. Why? I, so, I, I, so people can handle that, you know. Yeah. It's, it's a constant state of flux. Oh, I suppose. But I say I never felt unsafe there. It's exciting, though. For young people, I would think, yeah. to see this growth. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I can't think of anything. I think we covered the, the, the past and yeah. the present and some establish some good principles for the future. Is there too. anything in here that you want? Yeah, I, what I would like to do is um, is make uh, copies of some of these. You want me to <laughs> leave this here, and, it, and I'm sure it'll be secure because it the, will. But do you do? It's the only. It's th probably the only copy in you captivity. You can keep all of this, and we can pick it up at yeah. the luncheon. How would that be? I think that's brilliant. For the breakfast. Okay. That's brilliant. Yeah. Are you turned off now or are still No, we're still on. I we can turn it off any time. We can turn off we can edit whatever we want. Uh, you can you can you know, I, I know you'll take care of it and that it'll be safe. It will, I'm afraid yeah. to even uh, uh yeah. You know. Although Doctor Levin left me I, think. I have uh, uh, maybe you it might interest you to know that I have needle we I belong to a uh a uh International needle needlepoint guild. That's the other part of its life. Needle yeah, point. needlepoint. And uh, Princess Grace was an honorary member, and she invited us to Monaco every year for an exhibit, and she would give out awards, which I did one year, and I got some awards from her. And I had stuff. Our, our guild, our national guild. Make something for the government every year. Like one year we made a uh, wall hanging of uh, all the birds of the of the states, and one year we made a wall hanging of uh, all the seals of the 50 states. Uh, and uh, and then. Uh, Oh, we always make something for me. And uh, I was involved in, in a lot of those things uh, that are hanging in Washington and around there. How did you become interested in Needlepoint? That's a good question. You know, when I was in Palestine, I went to the Western Wall, you know, everybody goes to the Western Wall, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I put a little note in there like everybody else. And when I came back, I went to a wake of one of my friends, uh, and this lady was doing uh, a needlepoint of the Western Wall. And I got so fascinated, and I sat down and watched her and talked to her, 
and I, you know, explained it. I had been there, so this had some meaning to me. And I said, where did you get that? And she told me she, she got it in New York or someplace. So I had a good friend of mine that was a toy buyer that used to go to New York. And I told him, if you ever see a, you know, something like that, will you get it for me? And he did. He brought it home, and I, I worked on it. Uh, from what I had learned from her, and uh, of course my father taught me a lot about <laughs> needlework because he was a designer. You know, he used to make all our own clothes, hand stitched. And I did that, and then I went to a needlepoint shop. And uh, I, I got interested and joined the class. And, uh, and then, that, then somebody uh, told me that there was a, a local guild here. It's called the Starlight Guild. And they, uh, they said, why don't you contact them? And, uh, and so I did, and I joined them. And then I really got uh, hung up on needlepoint. Of course, you're, as a surgeon, I imagine you would have had great right, hands. Right, right. You know, I, in between cases, I used to do needlepoint. And I, I did it for all the doctors. They wanted, they said, will you make this for me? Will you make that? So I did. So most of the stuff I give away. Although I do have a pretty good album of what I did. And do you still needlepoint today a little bit? Or? No, I can't. I can't see. Oh. So I, I could do big stuff, but it's nothing like real fine. Fine work. Yeah. yeah. Fine stuff. Is, uh, now, one time they commissioned uh, our guild to do... Uh, the uh, the logos for all the uh, missions that were flown, you know, in space. There were 242 missions, and if you wanted to get involved, you had to give them a sample of your work, which I did, and I was assigned. I was assigned the one that had what's that gal's name that just died? That one, the first woman in space. Oh, Sally Wright. Sally Wright. You remember the Sally? Yeah, that's Sally? Good. Okay, well, I did the one that she flew on. And then they invited us down to Stennis, Mississippi, because they, oh, yes, they were just uh, remodeled their, their museum. And they had these all framed and everything. Every, logos. Every, but they were the logos. And they were all Careful. framed. And on the wall, on the wall, and they were just gorgeous. They're 242. Old. That was the opening the visiting bureau in Stennis Air Base. Yeah. And how many of those needle points did you? 147. No, 242. 200 and something. You were you were number 143. I don't know what the fuck. But if you ever get to Stennis, Mississippi, Stennis, Mississippi, or Very Washington. Handy. Dennis There's Dennis. a lot of stuff of mine in Washington. In Washington, is that the Blair House? Blair, oh, the Vice President's House. Yeah. Yeah. I, we did four chairs, needlepoint, and four chairs that when they remodeled uh, the uh, Blair House. The United Way. And United. one of them is mine. And when I was in Washington this last time, I asked them if I could get in there to see it, but I couldn't. They, they were. Wasn't enough time. What about the piece at United Way? Oh yeah, and I, at the United Way, I have a headquarters. Where it, that is. It's uh, it's depicting all the different things that happened to the United States over so many years. And I did the one with the firemen that pulled the fires in, you know, fire wagon with the two wheels. And, the and that's hanging in the uh, in the United Way Museum. So you helped in Alexandria. You helped to make history. 
in World War II. Okay. Yeah, and then in your, and then you come back and you're fashioning these the representations, yeah. these yeah. pictorial descriptions yeah. of these great uh, yeah. events and people. But and I, I, I was fascinated by needlepoint. Yeah, well, you've been doing that for it's really. I did it for 40 years. Early yeah. 70s. Yeah. I hated to give it up, but I just, can't, you know, I can't. A lot of doctors do hand, you know, hand work. Is that right? I don't know why, but they do. I, I've known Well, that they're, they're artists fine, and... Fine uh, motor skills. Yeah. 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 The artists, they draw a lot, of, a lot of painters. A lot of doctors are painters. Matter of uh, fact, tomorrow I'm going to go a meeting um, from my guild. I, I go every year and I, I donate a scholarship for somebody that wants to join Needlepoint. So I, I donate uh, oh, one to scholarship. We used to go to all the Mayo, uh, what do you call it, clinic reviews every year too. Yeah. We did that for years. The Needlepoint organization, does that have a, uh, is that the name? The American Needlepoint Guild. American Needlepoint Guild. ANG. ANG. I can get you that address yeah. and stuff. Yeah. 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 Find it. yeah. Those are all little keep things that keep them out of pools. <laughs> well, you never smoked. Did you ever drink? No, I don't. No. No. I don't like, I, 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 don't, I like those drinks that are sweet like uh, grasshoppers or something. Oh, cocktails yeah, or something. Cocktails. Yeah. yeah. You know, made with things that taste like malt and milk or milkshake. <laughs> But I, I don't even drink that anymore because of my eyes. They told me not to yeah. I drink alcohol. Yeah. And, and Dr. Wilder, were you at Wrigley Field recently? Wrigley Field? The last time I was, oh, you know, when I was a Holy Family, we operated on Vince Lloyd's wife. And uh, the, the following day, I went up to visit her and see how she was doing. And she, I don't know how it came about, that she's a needle pointer. <laughs> so we talked a lot about needle point, not, not about her operating. And her husband walks in, Vince Lloyd. And uh, I told him, I've been watching the Cubs for 100 years and I'm waiting for a World Series. He says, well, how would you like to come to the press box? I said, oh boy, would I? And he invited me, and I went there. And you never saw a ball game until you see it from the press box. You see everything. It was great. And I went in, and then I went once more. I took my grandson with, and Lou Boudreau was there, and uh, what's that fat guy's name? Uh, Jack Burkhouse. Huh? Burkhouse. Brickhouse, Brickhouse was there. <laughs> so I got to meet them, and uh, that was interesting. Uh, but that's, I went one time, uh, I, I, in order to go to a ball game, I have to sit behind a backstop, otherwise I can't see the ball. No, we don't go anymore. So I don't, I don't go unless. He can watch television pretty yeah, good. Yeah, television I can watch. But I can't, but that's a, that's I'd have to get behind it. To go to the game because you can't the, follow the ball at all. Yeah. You know. Well, he was also a handball enthusiast until the, until the Oh, Michael. I played for handball for 70 years. Yeah, that came to my mind because I think there's doctors that play handball. Yeah, yeah. I played yeah. with, I played well, with uh, Dr. Yeah. Levin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was one of our players. Yeah, they get together. You know, we Friday meet every so Friday, <laughs> all the old handball guys. We meet at, what's the name of that place? Al's, Al's, Al's Beef Al's Place Beef on, uh, on uh, Tui. Yeah. It's near the uh, Leaning Tower. So we meet every Friday, all the ex handball players. There's still a couple that play. guys do. Some of them give in and play paddle ball, which they don't think is worth the effort. It's not as pure a sport, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, so handball is quite great pure. sport. Left to your right, you got to be ready. Sport. Yeah. yeah, great sport. Yeah. I played for 70 well, years. You didn't quit that too many years ago. You only oh. quit that about five years ago. 
Yeah. And he couldn't see the ball anymore. I couldn't see the ball when I went in, in the light. If it came back straight, I could see it. But if it came back high in uh, the ceiling, I, I just couldn't. Couldn't. Although they wanted me to play, they said, we'll back you up. Yeah, no way. I said, no, I'm not spoiling your game just because you want me to play. So... Dr. Wilger, when you meet the boys on on the Fridays or whenever, do you have a cup of coffee? Do you, no, do you I take don't caffeine? Do you don't I take don't caffeine? Drink no, tea I don't, or? I don't drink caffeine. That's another thing they don't want me to drink. Caffeine. Yeah. Oh. So the decaffeinated. Decaffeinated. Yeah. I don't drink coffee. I never drank coffee. Drink tea? I, very rare. You know, when. When I went to France, you know, where do we get off? I think in Cherbourg, we got off the ship. And I had to drive a eight-wheeler to where we were going across France with the enlisted men from the, you know, the hospital unit. And it was bitter cold. And I said, boy, I ever see a place, a Red Cross place, that I'm stopping and getting some coffee. Well, we finally did run into a, a Red Cross place, and I got the coffee to one sip, and that was it. I just, I love the smell of brewing. Yes. But I can't stand the taste of it. You won't even eat coffee. We didn't, we didn't have it when we were kids. My parents drank coffee, but we drank Postum and cocoa and Ovaltine. No, we did too. Yeah, but not oh, uh, coffee. Yeah. And my brothers and sisters, uh, they never they never drank coffee either. Now they do, but no, they yeah, don't of course they're, they're not. Dead. They're all dead. I'm the only one in the family left. That's what I say. I, you know, all these things that I <laughs> used to have friends, but I don't have them. Except the you know the young the young cousins that. Uh, so we're leaving you with all the goodies. You are, yeah, you're, I, I appreciate the expression of trust, but I will look after them, okay. definitely. Okay. And it's a very, you've given us a very generous interview, and you're also uh, uh, very generous. If in there's the, anything uh, else that you want me, to, and artifacts. want me to come back or something, i will be glad to do it. Well, the only thing you would want back would be this. Well, I'm, I'm going to give this to you right now. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll scan this right now. Okay. okay. Well, you, that's is okay, there, but you're going to give it, if you want to keep the yeah, book keep and it. everything, you can keep it all together. Sure. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Just give it the other so way. do I need to give you You can any? have that. We Are you sure? It. Oh, this you can have. Yeah. yeah. No, I have and this piece wrist. you can have and the pictures you can have. Yeah. Just put it in a box. Yeah. Just keep it all together and we'll pick it up when we come for the breakfast. Terrific. Is that okay? That's wonderful. And oh, uh, can we have the hat? You can. Here, babe. Get another hat. Would you like a T-shirt? Pardon? I, that's my last hat. Would you like a T-shirt? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we got a T-shirt from the honor thing. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got a shirt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Mr. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned that about Mr. Spitzer. Anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Levin gave us a very good interview. He had a very interesting yeah, time in, in the world in oh, World War Two. He, he's, he's really uh, impressed with it's, you. It's funny, you know, he gets here with the with the Marines, you know. He goes, you know, Neil, the Marines, they did not do it all, you know. <laughs> so then the Marines are there, you know. But uh, but anyway, Doctor Levin said, Neil, you gotta you gotta interview Doctor Williger. It's yeah, just I know. It's a great he, interview. So he, I want to. He just built you up. I want to thank you, Doctor Williger, he, for he giving he us a great interview. He built you up, and he says, and for you your got, help, Marjorie. He says you gotta go. Very <laughs> kind. <laughs> So uh, until the next time. I says, okay. Yeah. I says, uh, give, me the, give me the name and telephone number now. We'll do it? Yeah. And we did it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I got to Cairo, and I got my room at the Shepherd Hotel. And uh, I want to take a, a shower or a bath or something. I turn on the lights. And all of a sudden I hear, turn off those goddamn lights. <laughs> Don't you know there's a raid starting? I, knew, I didn't know what a raid was to start with. 
but uh, blackout. That, everything was blackout. That's what they wanted, yeah. Yeah, and that was at the Heliopolis. We were right next to the Heliopolis. And nobody told you when you went in? No. You're supposed to know that. No. Who told me? Nobody knew I was there. <laughs> uh, but I was, when I heard it, there was a raid. I figured, boy, forget it. I never did get my bath. Did you take your shower? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. P.S. <laughs> no. And, and, and then it happened at the, we were, well, the airport that we were stationed at, at that time was called the Lida Airport. It's now called the, ben, what is it, the Ben Gurion or something? But it was a small, small. In place. Palestine. Uh, in Palestine, yeah. yeah, and and they had a they had a. I heard the sirens go off, and I I'm standing in front of the building, so my the uh, my commanding officer says, "You better get out of there and get in the slit trenches." So we had to go through the slit trenches because they, they, they were the slit, the slit trenches. Oh. They were expecting a raid. It never happened. They had enough of them. Yeah. But other than that, I, uh, I don't think I was ever in real, real danger. To, like the guys at the front lines were. Yeah. Could have been interesting on that fruit boat or that banana boat. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. You know, we had... Two fifty caliber machine guns and two cannons. <laughs> and every time this merchant marine would test them, they never go off. <laughs> well, they How told you sure? had no ammo. They yeah. were right. Yeah. Huh? yeah. They would never. You know, they never worked. Real protection. Uh, oh boy. Yeah. But we had. You know, I, I had to stand watch. You know, everybody on the ship. Had to take turns standing watch for four hour watch. You know, like I would know if there was a submarine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But uh, being in a in a in a boat like a ship like that, yeah. all alone, boy, it's going at that speed. Of course, you know we were zigzagging all the time. Yeah. That. Yeah. Never, never the same course. Every minute they change courses. That's why it took us so long to get to Cape Town. It took about six weeks to get to Cape Jeez. Town. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Williger. Thank you.